And I've been dealing with this now for 40 some odd years. And when God showed me about the deliverance in 1978, the first thought was, why, why, why is everybody doing this? Well, it hasn't hardly changed. And so I boil it all down to this. Whose church, whose, for what's the word here? I don't want to call it an organization. But all, what we're doing here, who, who's, who started this and whose is this? Whose this is? Why are we here? I think what I see is this was Jesus's, not his idea, but his plan. I'm going to have, and for one of a better word, because it's not a good word, but I'm going to have a church, my church, my ecclesia, my call out ones, and I'm going to have them come together. Oh, yeah, for what? Well, I'm going to let the... I'm going to anoint men, apostles and prophets, to build my church, and I'll be the chief cornerstone, and they will then be the foundation of every single body of Christ. Oh, okay, okay. That's the foundation in Ephesians 2. And no longer will there be Jew and Gentile. There'll be no Jew that will know God or the Father or without me. They'll have to come through me. And of course they kill me and they curse themselves by saying, let his blood be upon us and our children. But I've made the way that they can break that curse if they come to me. But if they don't come to me, they're just another group of people. They're not the chosen anymore. They failed. And I cursed the fig tree. I went to the fig tree, and yes, it was out of season. And yes, there probably wasn't supposed to be any fruit there, but, but when I found no fruit on that tree, I cursed it. And Peter saw it, and he said, it's cursed through the roots. Boom. And I sent ahead of me a a foreteller of me, his name John the Baptist. And he came and said, I'm going to lay the axe to the root. So that was dealt with to the root. There's no stump of Jesse anymore. He's got a new creation and it's called the ecclesia of the church, and it's unique in that it's a supernatural people that are anointed just like Jesus because when he ascended, he gave gifts to men, and then he gave gifts to individuals, and then he, God the Father set up the organization. He said, first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, and then workers of miracles and so forth. It's all there in the Word. So I was thinking this morning, when I was a Baptist, I didn't know any better. I mean, I grew up in that, like a, like a Catholic. And thank God, you know, what we've come out of. And it's had to be God. You're sitting here, and you're there, because God Hold you out of something. And we're not going to that. But I remember, I don't know why this morning I was thinking I had forgotten about it. Every month we had a business meeting in the church on Wednesday nights. And of course we didn't have elders. We didn't believe in elders. We had deacons. Not, not realizing that a deacon has, is not to have any authority in the church. A deacon is a table server. 
A deacon is somebody that serves. The authority that God established in the church, first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, and, and Peter said, I'm an elder. What's an elder? A more mature man that begins to watch over the group, the flock. Not to control it, not to preach the sermons every Sunday and anything like that, but just to watch over and if see somebody in trouble, to either pray for them or go to them or whatever, but to watch over the flock. And if a wolf comes in, and this was the counsel of Paul to the men from Ephesus, you know, you're going to have wolves come in among you. You're going to have Jezebels come in. And that's where the elder steps in and says, whoops. And anyway. So it's, it's very clear about what he wants. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, and so forth, you know. And then the structure is there in Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 12, and 1 Corinthians 14, and there it is laid out by the, one of the greatest apostles. And how God chose that man at his purpose. And we're not going to that. So here we sit. And uh, maybe not thinking, thinking, well, let's go and we'll sing and, and we'll hug each other and, and we'll share a little bit. And we'll, listen, you that are here with us, uh, you're here this morning, and I heard this coming over. I didn't say it to the brothers, but you're equipped more than 98.9% of any Christian by knowing even to wanting to be here in a gathering like this. And the big problem is Christians aren't being equipped for the work of the ministry because it's, it's perverted. Perverted to a pulpit and a sermon and a choir and a bunch of music and so forth. And yeah, music's fine and wonderful, but it's not the key thing. It's not here to be blessed by what we see and what we hear. It's here to be a part of something and realize that I have a part in this. And it's important that I see whether or not I ever get to share it or not, but I'm sitting there saying, I think I've got something to share. And the timing may not be, but it may be. And when we sit on something and we're hearing it and we're holding back because of fear, we're going to get in trouble. We're resisting the Holy Spirit. Maybe and quenching the Holy Spirit in ourselves. And if you hold back something like that, you quench the Holy Spirit in your life. And then you wonder why the weak it's not what it ought to be. When we quench the Holy Spirit, it's serious. And especially when we resist it like the Pharisees did. And Jesus said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? We refuse to receive what you're seeing and what you're hearing. So I, all these years of teaching, so many people have just refused to hear and see and then do. Three aspects of the curses. And the final aspect of, of a curse. First of all, you, you see the curse and you, or you see what to do and, and you don't do it. It brings a curse. And then when you see and you don't do it with joy and gladness of heart, it brings a curse. And then when you don't do it, if you notice the list of curses in Deuteronomy 28, it's worse. Oh, well. Not oh, well. So when you go to 
thinking you're doing something for God and go to a place where you, you can't prophesy, you're not getting equipped, you're not learning how to prophesy, you're not hearing a teaching on how to be equipped and what to do and so forth, you're wasting your time. Oh, I, it's, it's, the music's wonderful. And I'm just going to say, so what? Do I love music? Absolutely. You know I do it. I, I, write, I write music. But brother, the main thrust of the church is not a praise service. In fact, what I see, it's not even a worship service per se. There's, worship is, is our life. It's, it's not something particular, distinct, and outside, so to speak. It can be. But he said, how is it when you come together what each of you has? And so the mentality of many Christians is, I'll go to church, I'll hear a good sermon, and I will sing. I may even lift my hands. I may even get tears and get touched. But am I getting equipped? Am I being changed and transformed? Am I getting delivered? Am I getting cleaned up? Am I getting the demonic influence out of my life? Am I getting my marriage in order? My home in order? My life in order? Is this working in my life or not? And you know what I'm saying. And I told the Lord this morning, I said, Lord, I don't want, I don't want anything to do with that. I, 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 I want the real thing. I, as we might say in today because of the influence of movies, the right stuff, the real thing. Coca-Cola, no. Coca-Cola is not the real thing. What is the real thing here? We've all been in the, out there. To me, if I end up with no church, nobody, I want the real thing. Because that's all that's going to count in, in eternity. I'm going to have to stand before God and say, okay, Stephen, Micah, what about your life? I'm, I can't turn around and say, well, Frank Hammond or the Southern Baptists are. It's me and him. And it's for all of us. Okay, did you hear anything? Did you really see what my word was saying? Did even this morning, I realized that when you preach the truth, you're going to bring either judgment or deliverance and healing. There, there's nothing in between. And people that sit under true ministry will be judged for not heeding what they heard and saw. They will. It's all personal judgment. What do you do with it? Oh, well, I was afraid. That's not going to work. Oh, well, I, they told me that's not going to work. You realize that? I'm not trying to put fear in anybody, but, but warning, warning, warning. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ for the deeds that we did in the flesh. So is it important where I go to church? Absolutely. Is it important what I understand and believe? Absolutely. We got a Bible. And see, I shared this with somebody this past week. Oh, I need, when, when you teach, I need the chapter and the verse up there on the screen to prove what you're saying is true. Oh, you do? I've been, yeah, I've been. It's good. But on the other hand, 
if I preach the truth like Jesus did, and when Jesus quoted there in Luke 4, Isaiah 61, he didn't stop and say, okay, in the scroll now, in, uh, in page 3245 or whatever, uh, this is where it's written, and he quoted it. No, no, he just said, this is what the word says. Well, I'm not sure. Well, then go look it up for yourself. Get your Bible and learn to use it like I do. Can you hear me? I'm not accountable for every single iota in your life. You've got to take authority and say, I'm going to live this life. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever it takes for me to be a part of, like it says, and begin to see what this word is saying and seek not only to hear and, yeah, I understand that, I believe that, and then do it, do it, do it. And all hell will stand against you at some times. The forces of evil will come. Even your own family will come against you and so forth. But do it. So what God's telling me here, what he wants here, and it's not what I want. In, in that sense, it's not. It's Lord, he knows that I want what he wants. He's brought me to that place as much as I know. And here's what I see he wants. And I've got the scripture here, but I'll just leave the screen there, okay? It's in, I, I went to Acts 4 again this morning. And remember, the guys came in and they were trying to kill him and arrest him and so forth. And the little church was meeting in a house somewhere. And they gave the report. And they began to pray. And basically they said, well, let me, let me see if I can find it here. Praise the Lord. Turn to Acts 4. You would. Uh, it's not, okay, I'll, give me a minute here. Okay. So when these guys saw the boldness, it says uh, in chapter, in verse 13, that when they saw the boldness of the Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. These were the leading Apostles that Jesus chose. Uneducated, common men. What? No doctor's degree, no theology in the, in the seminary, no formal education at all. And yet I was told, you better get the college degree and go to seminary if you're ever going to be anything for God. That's what I was told. And I bought the lie. And like Paul, I've had to count it all as dung. And look what's happened. Look what's happened. And that's not what God wants. That was a problem they had with Jesus. Where did this man get trained? Where did he get his education? Who does he think he is? He doesn't have any degrees, diplomas on the wall of his office. But he didn't have an office. He didn't have a headquarters. He didn't have a building. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He said, even the foxes do, but I don't. So what was he saying? I'm looking for a body of believers where I can lay my head. Lord Jesus, make us that body where you can come and lay your head and be the head. 
the elders, the shepherds, the prophets, nobody's the head. Not even the apostles, but you. Period. And the true headship we don't see. The true headship of the true church is invisible. But the people that are truly of God see the headship because they have to see it by discernment. They have to see it by supernatural ability to see who the head really is. And that changes everything. It's not that dude in a suit with a tie on behind a pulpit. Not at all. And so they recognize that they've been with Jesus and so forth. So the guys finally are let loose and say, and says when they were released, there in what, verse 23, they went up to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. The head of the denomination, the Pope said to them, the bishop said to them, ha, whatever, no. And when they heard it, they lifted up their words, voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, and he quoted out of Psalm 2, why did the Gentiles rage. Now, this is another translation, I understand. And the people uh, plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's us. And right now, in our leadership, our government, they are plotting against us. How so? They're plotting against the kingdom of God, the word of God. They don't, don't, you read this Bible in the schools and little by little the plot is being filled out. And eventually, if something doesn't happen, it's going to hit right here. It's already in progress. And we, I think we understand that. And I'm telling you, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, I, I mean this with discernment that God's given me. We have a president that is totally demonized. And we say, well, he's got counselors. Where did he get his counselors? He drew the counselors to himself. Out of his own wickedness, he's gathered around him, demonized people. And he's the key man. And he plays the game of being dumb and stupid. And yeah, he's lost his mind. He, maybe his carnal mind of Joe Biden's gone. But Satan is in this man. If you can see it, we've got Satan in the White House. Just like we had Judas at the table of the final supper. So, for truly in this city there were gathered together against you, your holy servant Jesus, this is a prayer, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever you had, what, what your hand and your plan had predestined to, to take place. And now, Lord, and here's the key thing, look upon their threats and grant to your servants, and this is the main part here, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Don't hold back anymore. Even with mom and pop, wife or whatever, and husband and children, don't hold back anymore. 
I got a daughter that hadn't spoken to me in almost three years because I said it. Okay. While you stretch out your hand to do what? Heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. What did they pray? Boldness, miracles, signs, and wonders. Period. So what does God want from us? What does God want from us? A building that looks nice, a building that's comfortable, nice sound system, nice carpet, nice rooms, get together and eat a little bit, or what? To come together and have some nice music and share a little bit and, and so forth. What's he want? What's this all about? It's about a people that are supernaturally endowed, anointed because they've been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. And all of them have signs following them. And not just casting out demons. Not just praying for our children and they get healed. Or even our family. And they get healed. Some of you got family in the hospital, go lay hands on them, you know, whatever. And miracles, work miracles. What kind of miracle do you need? What is it that you need that there's no possible logic way for it to happen? Huh? Need a new car? How's that going to happen? I've seen this in this place right here for these last 30 some odd years. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Financial, yes. Physical, yes. People show up. Hey, I want to do something here. Really? Yeah, I'm a plumber. Or I'm an electrician. It's happened. What is, how that happen? A man from Houston came up here wasn't really a, a believer came with his wife and he, he, he sat here and he said, he got to looking around. He said, I want to do something. He went out here. He went down to Home Depot and bought stuff and put it back here in our electrical box because it, he saw a need down back there and of shorts and so, so forth. And he's never been back since. But he came here and did that work and bought the parts for us. Huh. So what will God not do for you? Or anybody, see? Let these signs follow us. The fact that God put this property in my hands. What a sign. Because I didn't want to be here. And the only reason I sit here on this property today is because I know this is where God wants me. Do I, is, is it my choice? It is because of his choice. But old Steve Bell, I wouldn't be here for a New York minute. I'd be on a lake somewhere. Yeah, I'd find me a lake ministry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start a lake ministry or cowboy ministry or motorcycle ministry. No. No. What do you want? And if there's ever a time for a supernatural people in every nation, every state, every city, every town, it's now. So how do we do that? We get deliverance. Well, first of all, we get born again, truly born again, truly born again. Nicodemus I don't think he ever made it. I don't know. Maybe he did. 
We get filled with the Holy Spirit and we're not ashamed to speak in tongues. We must speak in tongues. If we got the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. Don't let them tell you any, any other lie. And when you get anointed like that, you begin to expect supernatural things to happen. And then you begin to get cleaned up. And you realize you've got demonic things in you. And don't listen to them. You can't have demons now. You've got the Holy Spirit. Are you kidding me? <sighs> Let me tell you, it's going to get worse because you've got the Holy Spirit and your demons. And then you realize, I've got to get rid of the demons so the Holy Spirit can have more dominion. And that Jesus came above all else. First of all, bringing this whole new ministry of casting demons out of his sheep. And there you go. And these signs shall follow you. And upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it anymore. Unless you let them. And I could go on about that. So what I'm saying this morning, brethren, is this. And yeah, I'm stirred up. Very stirred up. What we sh I think God wants us to do, and I, I put it before the brethren too, let's begin to pray, and even if, as the Lord leads us fast, that God bring that here. That if there's anything known about this, this place, when people go down, up and down, or when they come in here to sit, they cast out demons. People get healed there. The kingdom is proclaimed there. Period. Oh, they have a children's ministry. Oh, they, the kingdom is proclaimed there. And there's no children's ministry in the kingdom except in the home by the fathers. We're going to do it God's way. We're not going to have counselors out here for the marriages and counselors for the alcoholics and counselors. No, Jesus is the head, the key. He's the answer. And the supernatural power that comes through him, from him through us delivers alcoholics. Drug addicts, cancer, tell us anything. But the Lord can't take care of it, period. And if it's not working, there's a reason we're going to find out what it is. We're going to fast and pray and say, okay, Lord, show us, show us, show us. There's always a reason. And it's not God not wanting to do this or anything else. Why aren't you healed, Brother Bell? Huh. so I can sit here and see what I see. I don't want to be a part of that trash, ineffective, dead church. And that's what it, without casting out demons and true healing, miraculous healing, it's dead, it's dead, it's dead. It's not Jesus. So we can sit here and, as I was saying, be another church on the block. How many is down pipeline? 20? 20 groups down through there? Church buildings? Church, Christian church down there on the corner? Then there's a big Baptist church on down there. And there's some groups that meet in some of the strip centers on down there and so forth. You go around the corner there and there's three of them down the street here. And here, on and on we go. So what? Yeah, the parking lot's full. Ours is not. But so what? How many in those groups are in the hospital this morning? How many of them need deliverance sitting in the pew? And not even told it, don't even know they need it. See what I'm saying? It's got to change. And if need be, 
Let us be part of the change. Let us submit to the Lord. Let us pray and seek him and wait until that happens. What happened when this group prayed? Said they were all in agreement. The building shook because of their agreement and their fervency and their desire and their truth. Does it take a long prayer? No. Does it take educated people? No. Simply people that are committed and anointed. So what are we here for? What are we here for? Well, here I'm, I'm sitting by myself. I know some of you are. But God's made you a part of this for some reason. And I'm talking about the reason that we get in agreement. Miracles will increase through you where you are, even though you say, I'm, I'm alone. You won't be alone for long. And even if you are, it only takes one. It only takes one. And we see that. And how many times in the Old Testament the Lord said, I sought for a man to stand in the gap. So anyway, I, I guess I need, need to quit. I just run out of here, but I'm so stirred up. And it took something like this to get my attention. And so they can say, well, there's no healing there. He's, and he's on, a, on a walker. What kind of deal is that? I forgive you for that. I know. Most of the time, I know why. But sometimes I, I, I say, God, what are you doing? We woke up this morning and Abigail was in extreme pain. And I said, Lord, God, we need you here. What's this all about? If this doesn't work, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You want, you want to end up in a hospital? You want them to roll you out with a sheet over your face out of that place? Do you think that's what God wants you for you? Eating up with cancer because of your bitterness and because of the lack of faith that God can handle cancer in a New York minute or by the snap of a finger? What, who are we? What is, is this book true or not? Or is this just a fantasy that we're all playing out with just actors? Are we making a movie, as I said this morning? I've been in acting. I, I, I love to be an actor. I was good at it. Even in college. <laughs> I realized, hey, all the world, <laughs> as Shakespeare said, is a stage. But... The church has become a stage where everybody acts it out. You come in on Sunday morning, you're all dressed up. Who told you that? And you smile when in the car coming to church, you were grinning and listening to some kind of music and raising hell with your spouse. And oh, but, but I'm in church. How long can you hold on? How long can you act? Maybe, maybe two hours. And, but maybe, maybe he'll shorten his sermon so I can get out of here and we can raise some hell some more. I know what goes on. I watch my parents. I watch myself. And the folks that have been here a long time know that one Sunday morning, I was over an hour, an hour and a half late getting over here when I was still pulpit preaching because my wife and I had a falling out, my first wife, Linda. And I said, I'm not going over there until this gets settled. Yes. 
It's real or it's not. And when it gets very real, what the Lord wants, we start getting more and more separated from the world. And if our own family, our own children are in the world, what can we do? But leave them to the Lord. Pray for them. But go on. For God's sake, go on. Because it's your soul. It's your commitment. And it hurts. I was praying for my my daughters last night. It hurts when I see them hurting, having problems, but I can't turn around and go back. I didn't go. Amen. Amen. So I pray for a people that have that desire in their heart to want only what he wants. Throw all these traditions and things aside and say, Lord, make us those people like in Acts 4 that there be miracles and signs and wonders that flow through us because of you. Because that's who you are. And when you came, that's all you wanted to show us. So go tell that old fox Herod that I cast out demons. I do cures. And on the third day, I'll be perfected. And so Jesus said, admitted himself, I'm not perfected yet. What? And in the book of Hebrews it says, he learned obedience. He learned obedience. How? By the things he suffered. Hello? If Jesus had to suffer to get it, guess what? Guess what? Hmm? There's all kinds of suffering. Some were sawed in two. They say John was boiled in oil. Peter was crucified upside down. Praise God. <laughs> at least at this point, they don't crucify people in this country. And we have... Look at the freedom we have. Look what we have. And we can come here and not feel that we're in danger. Hope nobody sees my car out there. No, no, no. So how do we suffer? How do we suffer? We have to suffer. So it's different ways. Thank God. I don't have any chains on me. But I sure have some limitations. And I sure have some pain. And I sure do some suffering, especially at night. But I understand. Old Steve Bell, they could do anything. I pole vault 12 feet back then. I could run a touchdown. All these things. I could act in a play. So what? So, I don't ask to suffer. I just say, Lord, have what you want. And first of all, what I need. What I need to be what you want. And watch God. I'm a, a miracle in progress. <laughs> And so are you. And you.